Good afternoon. My name is Joan Tremier Williams, and I am the director within the Office for Regulatory Affairs at the Feinberg School of Medicine. And I also have the privilege of serving as the chair of the Northwestern University Staff Advisory Council, also known as NUSAC. It is my pleasure to welcome President Shiel, Vice President Goff, and our audience of staff members. Staff play a vital role at role in Northwestern success. On behalf of NUSEC, I would like to thank you for your continued service and dedication to the university. We appreciate your interest and presence today and for the questions you submitted. Before I introduce our speakers, I want to note that a reception will take place in the French Quarter right outside the auditorium door immediately after the discussion. Now a little bit about our speakers today. Michael H. Shield took office as Northwestern's 17th president on September 12, 2022. He also serves as a professor in the Northwestern Pritzker School of Medicine, School of Law. He previously spent <laughs> so, uh, <laughs> He previously spent 7 years as president of the University of Oregon. President Scheel is a nationally recognized expert in property, real estate, and housing law and policy and is the author or co-author of three books and over 40 scholarly articles. He served as dean and professor at the law schools at the University of Chicago and UCLA, and also held tenured faculty positions at New York University and the University of Pennsylvania. Lorraine Goff, a human resources leader with more than 20 years of senior level experience, joined Northwestern as the Vice President for Human Resources and Chief Human Resources Officer in February 2022. She has also served as Vice President for Human Resources at Penn State, MIT, and Washington University, as well as in leadership positions in both healthcare and private industry. Vice President Goff has a track record for successfully enacting change while supporting the needs of the organization and focusing on the well-being of employees. She earned a BA from William Woods University in Fulton, Missouri, and an MBA from National University in San Diego, California. Please welcome again President Shield and Vice President Goff. Thank you. Okay. Thank you, Joan, and thanks to all of you for being here and to President Schill for joining us this afternoon. Um, we have a lot of questions from the audience, and so we are going to make sure that in our conversation today, we try to answer your questions. But before we get started, I'm going to ask President Schill to make some opening remarks. Yeah, I'm, I don't have uh, a lot of opening remarks. I just want to thank all of you for coming. Uh, I know this is a busy time, and I really uh, am grateful that you came to uh, get to know me a little bit, hear a little bit about me, and uh, hear sort of my views on some issues. Um, I will note that they closed the drapes, so you look at us rather than the city of <laughs> Chicago uh, and, and the water, which I don't know how, to, how I'm going to take that. But the, um, but in any event, uh, I also want to thank you all uh, for caring so much about our students, uh, our fellow staff. Our um, faculty, it's just you are really the people that enable everybody else to do what we do in terms of the whether it's faculty uh, producing knowledge uh, or staff, other staff, uh, and, and taking care of our students. And that is why we're all here. So I want to thank you. And I'm really, really excited about uh, the reception, not just because I like sugar, uh, but, but which I do, uh, but, the, but I'm really excited to get a chance to meet you, uh, those of you who I haven't gotten to know face to face. Very good. Thank you, Mike. Um, and that is the goal today, to get a chance to learn more about our new president. And so we're going to begin the questions now. Okay. Um, so some of us have heard a lot about your background, Mike. But I know some haven't yet heard much about much from you or about your background. So could you share with us a little about your journey? What sure. brings you here to become the, the journey that brought you here to become our 17th president? So I, uh, I grew up in uh, Schenectady, New York, which is a small city uh, in upstate New York, about 150 miles north of New York City. Uh, my, I, I, I'm a first-generation uh, student. My dad 
worked in a factory and my mom was a nurse and we lived in my grandfather's house. Uh, and so it was a wonderful sort of family uh, upbringing. Um, I, uh, I, I always knew uh, from the time I was a little kid about the importance of higher education. My, uh, my dad in particular uh, you know, kept drumming it into me that I was going to go to Harvard. Uh, and I ended up getting waitlisted at Harvard, but I did get into Princeton, and so I was able to get a first-rate uh, liberal arts education, sort of like what we do here at Northwestern, and uh, went, wrote a book when I got out of college. Uh, it was my senior thesis. We, we, my advisor and I uh, turned it into a book, and so I guess I was always, my sister tells me that I was always going to be an academic. Uh, I thought I was going to give law a practice, law practice uh, a shot. So I went to law school and, uh, and then I practiced at a Wall Street firm for about a year and a half. Mm -hmm. I ended up not loving practice, which was no surprise, as I said to my family. Uh, I, I ended up not loving having clients. Uh, the... And teaching is almost as, you know, uh, almost self-employment at a certain level. You get to set your own agenda. And I love research, and, and I love teaching. Uh, and so I went on, uh, started at Penn, and then I'm not going to go through every school. Um, I then uh, went over uh, to the dark side uh, in about, uh, I think it was 2004, and became dean of UCLA. And uh, I just had a wonderful time there uh, and made very, very strong relationships with staff uh, that were my vice presidents, but also everybody in the building. Uh, and, uh, and, you know, I think what makes me tick is that I believe in what we do. And I know all of you believe in what we do. Uh, we... If you care about the future, you care about higher education because we are the future. We are training, we are educating the people who are going to be leaders in this country, the people who are going to come up with great ideas, great, um, uh, great innovations. Uh, we are creating research which is going to fuel the country, which is going to save lives, which is going to make life possible, which hopefully will deal with global warming at some point. And so I'm deeply committed uh, to our mission here. And my guess is all of you are too, because you can get other jobs. There's other, especially in this time, you can get other jobs and probably more remunerative jobs and maybe jobs with more flexibility. Uh, but being part of an educational institution is really special. And, um, and I hope you understand how much we appreciate you. Great. Thank you, Mike. So um, much like me, you've been at both public and private universities, most recently at a public university as president at Oregon, um, and you're now here as a president at a private university. What are the key differences? Yeah, so I've, I've sort of alternated a little bit in my career uh, in terms of public and private. And, you know, for the best of the publics, there's really not that much different difference, right? I mean, we share the same missions. Access, maybe a little more on the public side, but we're seeing private universities being encouraged to do more and doing more, including us. Uh, excellence, being the very best we can at teaching and at research, and impact making an impact on the world through our work, through the people that we teach, through, through the, the way that we go about spreading knowledge to the world. So I think those things are pretty similar. Um, and I've loved my experience in both public and, and private, although I will say sometimes public universities can be a bit more fraught. Um, all of my emails were discover. You know, I mean, the newspaper reporter could get all of my emails, so that was really weird. I mean, when you you have to watch what you say and how you say it, it's a little different in a private university. Um, public meetings, everything is all documents are public, so it's just there's much more of a fishbowl effect in a a, a public university. Um, 
And then you have the state legislature, which, which obviously plays a role. Here we have a board of trustees, uh, and uh, they're deeply committed to the school, so that's a little different uh, also. But, you know, the complexity of a public university is not so different. It's different in, in the type, but not necessarily the magnitude. I mean, Northwestern is a pretty complex place, and all of you see that. And one thing that's a little different is um, the level of entitlement at a private university than in a public university. In a public university, it's, you know, kids frequently who have can't afford to go to college. Um, you know, they're, they're just really, really super happy to have the opportunity of a lower cost tuition. And they don't require as much uh, of the velvet glove treatment that we do here at Northwestern as well we should do, right? I mean, we're charging our students $70,000 of tuition, and they come with a set of expectations. And, you know, you all are delivering many of those expectations. Uh, so that's a difference between the two. So what are your observations about Northwestern so far? So, and I've talked about this uh, a number of times. So I'm, uh, just just so you know, uh, I'm not going to be giving specific um, uh, details about what my priorities are going to be. I'm in the sort of listen and learn portion of the transition to as president. Um, You know, I think that uh, there is, during this period... I want to hear uh, what what your concerns are. I want to hear what faculty's concerns are. I want to get to know the students. And then as I put that information together, I'll come up with a set of priorities, uh, strategic priorities, and then we'll, we'll, go, uh, you know, we'll go forward uh, at that point. So right now, um, I, I have some general observations, and, and here's, here's a few of them. Uh, one is... Uh, Northwestern, everybody here has great ambition. No one is sort of here to mark time. Uh, no ac- none of the academics, the students, they all are, and then the staff too, they all want to get better and better and better. And, and you know, we probably take that for granted a little bit. Uh, and it's not that case in every type of institution, or even every type of um, academic institutions, so that's really great. Um, Our students are amazing. Uh, I had no idea how strong our performing arts are here. And, you know, I I heard once I accepted uh, the offer, I said people were calling me and saying, you know, theater is really great. You're going to love it because I like theater. And so I went to a production uh, at, at the Barber Theater last week, and the students were amazing. Their voices, it was like being on Broadway. Uh, so, the, And then they're so smart. I mean, I, I walk through campus over the weekend with my, on most weekends with my dog. And, you know, dogs are a total student magnet. And uh, I'm not saying that's the reason I do it, but they, uh, <laughs> but they totally break the ice. And our students are so well-spoken, so mature. Um, and, uh, you know, I do recognize... Uh, that my stock is about as high as it's ever going to be because I haven't made any major decisions. Uh, the, uh, so, um, you know, so basically this, the students are really great. The staff, the faculty, alumni, um, you know, just everyone loves, loves the school, loves the mission. Everybody has ideas about what should be done to change it, uh, and that's the way it should be, right? That, that means people are engaged in the institution. Uh, I think there is a pent-up demand uh, to get going, uh, which I feel a little pressure about because I think that, you know, given my predecessor was had announced he was leaving and then we had Becky announced as the chancellor. She didn't come for obvious reasons due to um, illness. Um, and so it's, it was a long period, right, a year and a quarter or something like that. And so people are sort of like, okay, time to go. Uh, let's get going. Let's, let's giddy up. Uh, and, uh, and, you know, so I, meanwhile, I'm resisting a little bit 
so I can learn. Because I think that's what's respectful. I need to understand the institution, the needs, the culture, before I start coming up. I don't want to superimpose my own sort of vision on something without actually understanding the culture. Um, Another thing that I thought, another observation, is I've never been at a place where every single person feels that they don't have enough space. Uh, the, I mean, it, it's sort of, you know, the, the number one thing, I mean, the, the, every, I walk in, we don't have enough space, we don't have enough space, we don't have enough space. Uh, the, and, and you know, there's a lake, and then there's a, a, so there's not a lot of, a lot of, a lot of leeway there, but the, um, but we need to, that's also part of the ambition, right? So we have to figure out a way, uh, to accommodate that. And, and lastly, um, I, I and, and this is something I've told the board, and I'm happy to tell you too. Uh, there are surprisingly few uncommitted resources for a fairly wealthy university. Uh, the, we have spent a lot of money and made a lot of commitments, which are coming forward now. And um, and so I don't think I thought when I came here that revenue was going to be quite the the um, the issue that it's going to be, and and that's going to be a, a refocus of my attention to develop that that revenue, because I know we have a lot of pent up demand, not just to do great things in scholarship and teaching, but also we're in an inflationary environment of seven eight percent, and uh, and people are feeling it. Thank you. That's really helpful. So actually, you shared a lot of observations, which I think is really helpful for us. I know these are still very early days for you. Um, But I also know that you value staff just as we value staff, that they are an important part of the university. I'm staff, uh, right? I mean, I I, I don't value myself. I don't have (laughs) self-respect. Good point. Very good. Um, But as you think about the vision and the values and the mission of Northwestern University, where do you see staff playing the biggest role? So staff, I mean, you know, it's a broad category, but the staff of a university are critical to everything that we do. Um, I mean, there isn't any piece of the university uh, that that isn't uh, doesn't rely on staff. Um, you're the essential partners of the faculty, you're the administrators, you're supporting administration, you're protecting our students, you're setting a role model for our students. So everything that we do here, I mean, just think for a second. What if you didn't exist? Can you imagine? I mean, you know, I'm a faculty member. I ca- just to get my computer running half the time, I have to call someone. Uh, they, uh, and, 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 you know, to, to, when I lock myself out of my office, you know, just all that sort of thing. Staff make possible everything here. Who's going to advise our students? Who's going to take care of our students? Who's going to feed our students? Um, who is going to make possible the materials for class, make sure the library's functioning? Um, so staff are part of everything that we do. And I also feel, you know, faculty, and I'm a faculty member too, so I have both perspectives. And it was a, I was a faculty member only for, I, I'm very proud I'm still a faculty member for about 20 years. And we tend to overlook that, right? We tend to think, you know, we're the... Uh, we're the uh, the uh, stars of the of, uh, of the of the universe, right? Uh, and and um, I think that we have to understand that the universe both has planets and stars and cause whatever else. I'm not an astronomy person, but the uh, the or ast- yeah. Uh, the uh, I thought I said astrology, and I said no, that's not. I'm not that either. Uh, the uh, but but you know we have to understand we all play our roles, and it's a, a symbiosis. It's it's all of us working together uh, that makes this university great. And uh, and and I think hopefully most of the people that you engage with on the faculty, and hopefully most of the students, if you're engaging with the students, they appreciate that and they treat you with the respect that you're due. Are there areas about staff life 
or the staff experience that you would like to learn more about? Well, everything. Uh, the uh, I mean, that's one of the reasons for today in the reception. I want to I want to hear what life is like. Uh, the I want to hear what it, what it's like to be working at the university. You know, what brought you here? Right, Chicago's a big city. There's lots of lots of different uh, opportunities. Why'd you come here? Why do you stay here? Um, what can we do? in Crown to make, and not just in Crown, uh, but all over the administration, what can we do to make you more productive? Um, also, for those of you who are new, what aspects of other workplaces that you come from should we take as best practices that we don't do? Uh, and so that that's an important thing. And really, how, how can I support you? Um, now, of course you'll understand that's not a blank check that I'm going to do everything that, that, that you want. I mean, just like I'm not going to do everything the faculty wants, I will do probably most of the things the board wants uh, if I value having a job, but the, uh, but, or the students for that matter. Uh, you know, but I'm going to do my best uh, to take care of you, and you're taking care of me. So there, one, there was a question regarding belonging. Actually, there were several questions about belonging. And so I want to ask you, based on your experience, how do you think that we can continue to build a culture where everyone feels like they belong here at Northwestern University? So I think that is the challenge for every institution right now as we become, particularly, uh, I can speak for higher ed because that's the institution that I'm involved in, but we have become more diverse over time. Mm -hmm. And with diversity, it's sort of easy, at least before the Supreme Court rules in June, uh, easy to hit numbers, right? It is harder to make those numbers work together uh, well and feel that everybody here can do their best work, uh, that everyone here feels they belong here, that everyone here, uh, regardless of, of your race, your ability, your gender, I mean, the... And, and you know, I'm leaving off nine million other things uh, that I'll probably hear about tomorrow. Uh, the, but it's very, very important that you feel you belong and you feel that you can do your, your best work. And, and I think that we haven't got, no place has gotten that right. I mean, Oregon, we, we, you know, we did a climate survey and we heard all sorts of bad things. And, um, and you know, the university has to work, but the most important to make it a uh, more inclusive place. And you know, I don't have a prescription for that. I don't think anybody's got the the off the shelf or uh, prescription. But I think the most important thing at this stage is to hear from, not have me sit here pontificating on what will make us more inclusive, but instead to hear what the people who do not feel part of the university aren't feeling uh, inclu included, what they think and what they need. Uh, again, I'm gonna do everything, I'm gonna be able to do everything, but you have to hear the voices, and so that's part of what today is, that's part of what uh, this period of my presence is, and then hopefully I won't stop listening in three months and then say, okay, well, now we're just off to the races and I don't care because things change, different circumstances happen. Our world today is 100% different, well, I won't say 100, 50% different than it was before COVID, another 50% different from when George Floyd was murdered. I mean, you know, the world's changing and we have to change too. All right, now we've had many, many questions about compensation. Um, you care about compensation? <laughs> it's not just the students? Uh, they, go ahead. And um, this is a, a, um, an important question for our staff, and so I wanted to um, take some time and talk about this. Sure. Um, and the first part of the question really is, what are Northwestern's plans for staff compensation to reflect the increased cost of living? And, what ha and how is Northwestern ensuring pay equity? So... And again, there's different groups and different things that are happening with different groups. But the first thing is, every university right now, probably every company, university, 
is having these sorts of challenges with, with compensation. Uh, when inflation is running at 7 8%, mm-hmm. you all are affected, right? And no university is giving increases that make that up, right? Because there just isn't the revenue to do that. We can't raise tuition 7 or 8%. So what we have, and then here at Northwestern, I think the problem is exacerbated by the fact that in like 18 or 19, we had very low increases or no increases, followed by COVID where we didn't have big increases. And so even if today we're in the market with other schools in terms of the percentage, there was that gap that just sort of exists. Um, And so I think... um, what we need to do, uh, this, this, again, turned out to be a priority that I didn't know I was going to have. Uh, and, and, but I'm hearing you know, from everyone that this is a priority. It's about retention. Mm-hmm. It's about hiring. Um, it's about making people feel valued. And so we have to, um, part of my job, big part of my job right now, is finding the resources to be able, we're not going to do 7 or 8%, but to, to be able to do something uh, meaningful, something hopefully more than even than we did last year, and um, and uh, be able to 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 help close that gap, and and you know I think there's three different aspects to this. One is inflation, so you're already starting seven percent, hopefully going down. Uh, the also we know that we have certain groups in the university, certain categories of people who we're not keeping up with what the market is. And so we need to address that or else we're going to become uncompetitive. Um, and we'll lose people. Uh, then we probably already have left the lost people. I mean, we always hear about the, the person who leaves the job and gets $40,000 more. You know, but... We can't have that happening across the board, right? We have to be be more competitive. Um, also, we have to think about equity, um, and over time, even innocent practices and sometimes non-innocent practices compound. And so, we have to understand for people who are doing similar work. In similar situations, similar categories, if you see discrepancies, and in particular discrepancies based upon race, based upon gender, or other protected groups, um, uh, we need to step in and 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 uh, and and try to il- eliminate uh, those. I mean, the other part of equity um, is that not everybody has to be treated equally, right? Some people need different other things, right? Equity is the idea that um, you you do what is necessary to have pe- everyone treated fairly. And so that's, that is a, um, I was taught that by my DEI uh, vice president at, uh, she showed me, I don't know if you've all seen this, the, mm-hmm. there's a cartoon with three, can- a tall person, mm-hmm. a short person, so the, the, the shortest person, needs the biggest can to look over the fence. Um, and, and that may be the case, and we need to, uh, we need to, to be sensitive to that. Uh, so compensation important, uh, super important, is probably the thing I talk about and do the most about thinking, and in in part of the thinking and the doing is to find the resources to be able to do this. Uh, because, again, our, our tuition is at market, some of our students are struggling. We can't just hike tuition. Uh, one of the things that we have to think about is new revenues. Um, and we also have to think about cutting costs. Uh, and, and, and that's more controversial. Uh, but it can't just be, uh, I mean, it, it isn't just one. Um, so we have to look about where we waste money and eliminate some of that. We need to um, look at where we could do programs, where we could, uh, size of our class, all of those things together. 
uh, how we can get the revenue that's sustainable over the long run uh, to close that gap between us and um, and some of our peer schools to the extent that that exists. In many areas, we're, we're, we're at parity uh, in terms of staff salaries and, and in faculty salaries. But one of the things I found out when I looked at faculty salaries is we're actually 12% above the aggregate, uh, the median. But then if you look, about 20 departments are like 5 to 10% below. So it's spotty, right? It is, it's not consistent. And so we have to, I'm sure the same thing exists in the staff. Uh, so we need to, to, to focus on that. Okay, yeah. Thank you. Those are all really great comments. And um, I share your thoughts. I mean, the number one challenge for us when it comes to compensation right now is inflation. Right. Um, and just like you, I arrived here um, not expecting this to be such a focus, but I've heard a lot from our staff about their concerns with compensation, and it is certainly something we're looking at. We are looking at um, how we consider um, inflation in our planning for merit increases for the future. We are looking at how we think about um, inflation, even in terms of our benefits. So this year for open enrollment, um, we, for the first time, adjusted the premiums based on, on um, or the increase based on salary level. And so those who earn more had a greater increase in the premiums than those who earn less, as a way of trying to begin to address some of these challenges. Um, but it is an ongoing concern that we all have. I'll say to you that we are also doing ongoing benchmarking. So we do look at our jobs against the market on an annual basis, and we do ad hoc reviews. So when we see a concern, we go to the market and we take a look at the market. And as um, Mike said, that we are in, in aggregate, we are competitive, but we do know there are pockets where we have to look further and make sure that we are competitive with the market on the staff side and certainly on the faculty side as well. Um, it is quite complex, but it is something that we are very much focused on because we do understand that it is you know, a key priority for our, our entire organization. Um, this question of equity is one that I think is very helpful because certainly we are concerned about equity across the whole organization. And that example that you shared about the difference between equity and equality, it's a really important one because sometimes people don't understand the difference. I do think sometimes when we get the question about equity, um, on compensation in our organization. Sometimes the issue is one of equity across the organization. There are some units that pay differently bait for the same role um, than other units. And that is a concern that I know many of our staff have. Um, it is a concern that happens in many organizations. Some units just have more resources than other, other organizations. But it's something that we certainly do try to look at. And from an HR perspective, we try to look at equity across the whole organization and we think about roles as much as possible. But I do know that is certainly an issue and a concern that's been raised by many of our staff. Um, I also want to share one thing on the topic of compensation, share with you that um, I know that for some time now there's been a request to post salary ranges and it's something that we have been talking about. I learned within my first couple of months here that was something that was a priority. There was a new SAC event and it came up there. And I said we will look into it and we will do what we can do. So I'm pleased to share with you that we are working on that process and we will be posting pay ranges in the new year. So stay tuned for that. She's <laughs> terrific, by the way. I, oh, oh, thank you. So I'd like, to, I'd like to shift our focus just a little bit to another topic that is really important to our staff, and that is workplace flexibility. Um, so what are your thoughts about the hybrid workplace? Okay, so I'm going to try to get you all angry with me uh, because I've seen the survey. Personally, I, I don't, personally, for me, Mike Schell, I want to be in the office every day. Uh, and I want to engage with my, with my colleagues. I want to develop relationships. I want to plop myself down in their offices and talk. I like talking about what happened on Grey's Anatomy last week. I mean, you know, so that's me. So I, and maybe it's generational. I understand, however, that my views aren't shared by everybody. And I think I understand that my views probably aren't shared by 98% of you because I did look at the survey. <laughs> and, um, and I understand why uh, it, that you know I I, I, am, I don't have kids and so I'm not I don't have to pick them up after school I don't need 
and I have a pretty flexible. Uh, well, actually, I have a totally inflexible life, but the uh, but but that I've I've asked for that. Uh, the uh, but uh, so I think what we need to do is take the lessons that we learned from the pandemic, and then move forward and try to sort of unlikely to make everybody happy, uh, but get to a place where we are um, in a meeting the needs, meeting the interests of as many people as we can while meeting the needs and the interests of the university and the students. Um, so, I, you know, this is a balancing act. There's, it's not yes or, it's not on-off, right? It is, we have to balance the desires of the workforce, um, you know, and, and we have to be sensitive, particularly those of us who are faculty, that we have that flexibility. We've always had that flexibility, uh, and 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 staff doesn't have, didn't have that flexibility. So we have to understand to get out of ourselves and understand the perspective of other people. Um, we have to understand, I think, in balance that we're an unusual type of workplace. We're a residential community, and we have students who expect people to be around, uh, and, and, and you don't want to ghost town. I mean, I was here walking Max on, during Thanksgiving, and, you know, wow. I mean, it was just totally empty, and that's good. I mean, people were home with their families, but the point is we want our students to see people and not just feel that they're, uh, that they're not here. Um, we need to think about productivity, uh, and, you know, I think that uh, based upon that survey, uh, it suggests that uh, most managers think that uh, a certain amount of remote is is consistent with uh, prior with productivity. Um, we have to think about team building and uh, and and sort of um, you know there, there is something to be said for people getting to know each other, developing bonds with each other. Uh, and that is harder to do on Zoom. Uh, we all know, we've all, all experienced that. Now, there may be jobs that we don't care that, about, about that. Um, I hope that everybody is part of a team and part of a community that we do care about that. So it's, it's adding all of that together. Um, and again, uh, I know that this is an issue that is all over the United States and we're gonna have to, we're gonna continue to deal with this over time, uh, and uh, I you know I'm certainly interested in hearing your views. Although I have a pretty good sense based upon the survey what they are, and hopefully we'll be responsive at the same time as we balance all of these things. But I just don't think it, it's not. This is one of the hard ones, uh, and uh, and uh, that that's going to be a challenge for us. And I mean. I, how do you, I mean, you probably, how do you see it, Lorraine, uh, the, uh, in terms of you're seeing a lot of this challenge right now and in terms of people's views, you saw, you sponsored the survey. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I think it is challenging for many organizations. As you mentioned, we are a residential campus and we want a presence on campus, but I also want to send the realities of what our staff need. I think that, you know, we moved into this flexibility very, very quickly. You know, the pendulum swung so far so quickly. None of us probably, you know, three years ago thought we could find ourselves in a place like this. But people have now learned how to work this way. And so it's really balancing the needs of the organization with the needs of the individual. Um, and we talk about the survey that we looked at, and there was clearly um, an interest of maintaining flexibility, which we have. Our guidelines allow for um, flexibility while trying to consider the needs of the organization. Um, we also learned that there were certain pockets of people that wanted more flexibility. We, you know, based on the demographic information, women tended to want more flexibility. People who are younger wanted more flexibility, which sort of makes sense, doesn't it? It's sort of stage of life. And, and I have two children. I remember with my children, the challenges of getting children to and from daycare and all the things that you do and managing a life. Um, and so we really are trying to just kind of figure out how we balance the needs of the organization and the individual. But it is certainly a priority to our staff and certainly a new reality that we're all grappling with. 
And, you know, I think it's important that we're not rigid as we think yeah. about it, uh, which I sort of indicated. Uh, like, we can't take this position. Well, when I was there, we did it this way. Instead, we have to move with the times and move with the needs of, of our community and also uh, be competitive uh, because, in many cases, uh, if you aren't flexible, you're going to lose some of your most valuable people. And we already talked about how staff are among our most valuable people. Um, yeah, that's exactly right. I think that we, you know, this balancing act that we're doing here, we, we want to make sure that we um, can recruit and retain talent, but also create the right environment where people feel as though um, they, they are being respected, that they are trusted to manage their work. There's this interesting balancing act that we are constantly trying to do. I do think there's a problem that the, uh, just uh, I'll just you know put more dirt on top of me. Uh, the um, I do think there's this issue about um, particularly for for younger folks is about career advancement. Um, if you aren't in front of people, I'm not. If you don't develop relationships at an early stage, I'm not sure what effect that's going to have on career advancement uh, for, for them in terms of will they be thought of as the person to take a new position? Will people know them? Uh, the, will people trust them? Um, so I think that's, that's another aspect of it. But, you know, I'm pretty free market on stuff like that. If people want to make mistakes, I'm fine. Uh, they should do that. I'm not going to protect themselves from themselves. But I do think it's a systemic issue uh, for our society is... Um, how do you how do you create the ability for people to move through a career um, successfully? Yeah, that's a good point. Thank you. Um, so there was a question regarding staff culture and what you find uniquely valuable about our staff culture. Um, and I'm happy to weigh in. Still fairly new to the university, but thought you might have some um, some comments to share as well. So, I mean, I think that um, what I find most valuable uh, is, I mean, I, as, as you can probably tell from, I'm pretty uninhibited and pretty transparent. And I want, what I tell my, my staff at every institution is I say, I don't know all the... I can't be sure I'm right all the time. I mean, I, I have a pretty good sense of, I think, you know, pretty good batting average. But I'm going to make mistakes, and uh, and I'm going to say things that... Uh, I'm going to say I'm going to do this. And and the worst thing you can do as as a staff member is not to pull me back if I'm going to walk out into the middle of traffic, right? I mean... I need and I value uh, people pushing back on me. Now, pushing back on me in a, um, you know, I'm worried what will happen tomorrow, but they, you know, pushing back on me in a respectful way, right? No, I'm not saying you jerk, you're wrong. Uh, but, the, but, you know, I, I care about people and staff folks uh, being able to speak what they think is the right Answer. I mean, you know, they may not. We may not ultimately decide to do something in the way that a staff person suggests. Just like faculty, we might not do something in the same way. Um, but it is important that we have a full airing out. So I think that um, I think that that is important, and I think no one should fear retribution. No one should fear that it will stop their career if they disagree with their. Um, uh, with, with, with someone who they work with, um, and uh, as long as it's respectful and as long as they understand, ultimately the supervisor or whoever it is does get the chance to make the decision, uh, but needs the most information uh, that they can possibly have. So I value that, um, uh, and, and I hope all staff people feel that. I also feel part of the culture that we have, and this is getting more difficult. I took this for granted uh, uh, all my life until probably about 10 years ago. And that was, in an educational institution, we should have free expression, right? We need 
the ability to, to state our views without fear of retribution. Um, at the same time, and this is, some of you may have read what I wrote uh, about the, the, the banner, um, just because you have a right, you should care about your community and you should care about what you do. I'm not going to punish someone for their speech, right? But I might say, I wouldn't have done that. I think that's wrong. Uh, and, 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 and communally, we can do that. But we, we should not we should allow people to express themselves because, you know, crazy ideas, unpopular ideas become orthodoxies over time. And, it's, and you need people to constantly uh, be trying to push the envelope. Uh, so I hope that's part of our culture here. Uh, feels like it is, uh, but um, it's, it's getting... That, that issue has become, it's been politicized. Um, um, you know, since when has the First Amendment become a, a conservative issue, right? When I was in college and law school, First Amendment was bedrock civil rights issue. Um, and we, we just have to get back there. Okay. Are there aspects of staff culture you would like to introduce here at Northwestern or um, further develop? Well, if those two things don't exist, I want them to exist. Uh, so, <laughs> so I don't have the I don't I don't understand the staff culture here enough. That's yeah. the that's the point. Uh, I need to. Yeah. So you know, I spend some time. I have a question or two for you. Absolutely. Should I? <laughs> yeah. Let me let me ask you. A question Absolutely. Or two. Yes. <laughs> I need a breather. Uh, the uh, but the uh, so put you on spot. No. The uh, the one of the issues that. Uh, I know we have a vacancy right here, mm -hmm. um, and uh, can you give us a snapshot on how we're doing on vacancies, um, and and both what are we trying to do to fill the vacancies, or at least the vacancies that need to be filled, um, and how are we doing at retaining people? to avoid the vacancies from occurring. Yeah. Um, Big set of issues. Yeah, absolutely. And this is certainly a question that we receive from our staff as well. So we've heard this, these kinds of questions um, for some time, and I am happy to share some progress in those areas. So um, when I first joined the university in February, we spent some time, my team and I spent some time thinking about some key challenges, and we created a set of rapid action teams. There were four of them, but one of them focused on recruitment and one focused on retention, and there were two others. And um, the recruitment one, we focused on doing a variety of things to shorten the time to fill and reduce the number of vacant positions. And so since April of um, 2022, we have gone from 718 vacant positions down to, as of the last count, 620. Now, the number fluctuates, but a dramatic drop. The first few months, we frankly couldn't get below 700. We've now broken that and gone further. And we have reduced the time to fill positions from an average 65 days to 60 days. Significant reduction in time to fill. Um, now, to make further progress, we really have to lean on technology. So we are also looking at a new applicant tracking system to help us further improve our numbers. And so we can ensure that we are able to recruit talent in this very, very tight labor market. Now, there are several things we've done to try to manage these areas, but I want to mention a couple of them. Early on, we um, acquired an enterprise license with LinkedIn, and that has allowed us to be proactive in our outreach to find candidates. People who are not looking for jobs, we can now reach out to them and invite them to apply for jobs here at Northwestern. We have increased the number of um, people who apply for our positions and we have increased the visibility of our positions now um, across the internet. So we used to have, prior to the launch of our LinkedIn Enterprise, about 11,000 views of our job openings every month. We now have over 210,000 views of our positions. We don't yet have the technology to show, based on those views, how many of those people then apply for positions, but that's the next step in the process. And again, we are proactively reaching out to candidates, so we are now 
having a larger pool in many roles, not all yet, but we're working on that, many roles, and they are coming to us with qualifications that we need for the posted position. They know what we're looking for, and we're getting those candidates applying for those positions. So we have had a laser focus on recruiting. We have also focused on um, key positions. So we use IT positions as a place to really think about how we can improve the process, and the rapid action team focused on IT in particular. We made some significant improvement there. We're taking those learnings for other areas. So we know that the research administrator positions are hard to fill. We're now trying to apply the learning there so we can try to shorten time to fill for those critical positions as well. Um, so those are really some key areas. And I'll say to you that um, we also have been thinking about the retention piece. In March, we did a survey to people who had left the university in the past 12 months to understand why they have left Northwestern University. We suspected it was the same reasons that people are leaving organizations across the country, right? You've all heard of the Great Resignation, but we wanted to hear why at Northwestern. And we learned that, in fact, they were very much the same reasons. It's about salary, so the compensation questions, very relevant. It's about um, the quality of supervision, the direct supervisor and that experience. I think we've all heard the phrase, people leave managers, not organizations, right? So that relationship is critical. That tends to be one of the higher priority areas. A perceived lack of career development. How do we progress in our careers? Um, ambiguity about hybrid and flexibility. There are people that are very concerned about that. And then stress and burnout. So we've been focused on all those areas. We've talked about compensation already. We are working on um, acquiring a tool that we can do more surveys. More, we will be doing an annual a survey as well, a culture survey. But those are big surveys that you do every few years. We also want to be able to survey in real time so we can assess what's happening in the workforce. If there are supervisors that um, need more training in certain areas, we might learn that from exit surveys and other surveys and develop programs to help support that. We are looking at career development and working through a process to um, create career ladders and lattices so people can see progress. Again, I, you know, I've always said, you know, we want to come here for a job, but we want them to stay for a career. There are opportunities here at Northwestern that people don't always realize. Um, they, we have them today, and they're available, visible on our website, and I'd encourage you, if you're interested, to take a look at those. So we want to make those things visible. We now have clarity, more clarity, around flexibility here at Northwestern. Um, again, we know that there are still people that are looking for greater flexibility, but the lack of clarity that may have been there prior to the survey is no longer the problem. Mm -hmm. And then I'd say the final piece, and a really important piece, is this issue of, flex of um, stress and, and burnout. So we introduced a new employee assistance program this fall that is at no cost. It's paid for by the university. It has resources for all of our faculty, staff, and our leaders. Um, filling jobs is probably the number one issue there, right? People are burning out because they're doing more work. There are vacant positions and someone's picking up the load. So the focus on recruitment will hopefully address that issue over time. And I would say to you that taking time away is important as well. So I'd ask those who are really challenged with this, and I know it's not always easy because you are concerned about the workplace and getting things done and supporting our students and our faculty, but I think you know many of us are leaders here. We need to model the right behavior, which is allowing people, taking time away so they know it's okay to take time away and to recharge, and so when we come back to the workplace, we've got more energy and more focus. So unplugging, I think, is an important part, but we are focused on all of those areas. Um, we have... You know, we are focused on turnover, and we monitor those numbers regularly. And our goal now is to reduce turnover. If we can slow down turnover, it certainly helps with the recruitment challenge, right? I would argue that we have more of a retention problem at the moment than a recruitment problem, because we are fixing the recruitment challenges. We now have to work on retention, and that is a priority area. So I have one more question for you. I think we've got time, so, mm -hmm. unless you've got something for me. No, go ahead. I'm, I'm happy to answer your so questions. You, so you asked me what are my observations, um, because I'm the newbie. But you're not that much <laughs> more senior than me here. Uh -huh. And you've been at some really good schools. Uh, what did it, MIT, mm -hmm. what was it? Before? Wash U. Wash U. Penn State. Uh, Penn State. Okay, yeah. so you've seen, you also have the public-private thing going on, mm -hmm. like I do. Uh, the So... How do you see, if you're going to compare Northwestern 
sort of, now it's over time and things change dramatically during that time, but how do you compare Northwestern with, uh, in terms of staff and um, in terms of staff welfare compared to those schools? Yeah. We haven't, we haven't, we haven't prepared this no. at all, so I have <laughs> no idea. Yeah. I feel guilty. Uh, what but might the, she say? <laughs> But you, um, you asked me, so yeah, I get to no, go back. Yeah, no, absolutely. So, um, like you, I've been incredibly impressed with the staff here at Northwestern. The commitment to the mission, the commitment to our students and our faculty, um, and it shows up in a variety of ways, right? People are focused on doing the best they can do, and there's real pride in the work that people do. So we see that here at Northwestern. We see that in many places. Um, but really, seeing it here at Northwestern is something that um, you know, I'm very pleased to see. I will say to you that um, most of many organizations are focused on this issue of belonging. And we hear this a lot here at Northwestern as well, like in every other organization. Um, and that's an area that is important to me. Frankly, my commitment to diversity, equity, inclusion, and belonging is both personal and professional. As a woman of color, as an immigrant, I moved to this country when I was 14. So I came here as a high school sophomore. I understand the importance of being in a place where you feel as though you belong. And that is not always easy when you're a newcomer to a community, any community. Um, so personally, I think it's very important. It's something that is a priority to me. And professionally, throughout my career, I have focused on the, in these topics and tried to help organizations move forward. Um, and I'd say to you that we all have some responsibility when we think about this idea of belonging. Right? It's not a program that one person can oversee and manage, that every member of a community has a responsibility and can have an impact on it. And so I often ask people to think about who do you spend time with? Who do you include in meetings? Who do you share information with? The more we widen our, our circle, the more perspectives we get, the greater that we allow others to feel as though they belong and, frankly, just broaden our thinking overall. Um, so I, I think that that is a... I've heard that a lot here, and I'd say that I hear that in other organisations. And that is, in part because of how the world has changed. Right? We're thinking about it now in a different way. Often we thought about diversity, you know, the numbers, and this idea of inclusion, you know, sort of people at the table. Belonging is a step further from my perspective. Right? How do you feel as though you're valued, you matter, your point of view is considered? Um, and that's really what we want to sort of move to in every organisation. And I hear that here. I don't think it's unique, but it is something that I hear and I know that we all value. Um, and I am you know, please and looking forward to continuing to help work develop in that space. And let me shell for a moment for NUSAC because one way to feel belonging is to feel engaged. Mm -hmm. And NUSAC, Joan is terrific, her colleagues in NUSAC are terrific. But get engaged, get get involved and use your voice. Uh, so, and you know, it's good that we did the survey because we have a good sense of voice on one issue. Uh, but, um, you know, I'm sure, I'm sure Joan uh, has lots of ideas for how you can uh, get involved. Yeah. So I think we're down to the last couple of minutes. Okay. So I'm going to shift to a couple of lighter comments, okay. questions. Um, and so um, we've covered a lot of big topics. So on a personal front, you've mentioned Max, your dog Max. Um, where are your favorite places to walk Max? So I really, uh, I, what I do is um, we come down here, walk along the lake, uh, which obviously is um, amazing. Uh, and and uh, then what I do is, and don't tell anyone, uh, is we go to Deering Meadow and uh, I let him off leash, and, and you know he, he goes running because there's a gate on the other end. Don't you know? There's no one there. I would never do that if there were someone else. Although he never bitten anything in his life, uh, mm -hmm. but the but but nonetheless, uh, but it's uh, it's a um, it's just really magical, uh, and and you know I get lost. I'm still getting lost as I walk through campus, uh, and I. I, in fact, today I just found out where where our sort of cathedral is. Uh, you know, it's, I had no idea. But the um, we have a building in the middle of campus that looks just like a cathedral, but it isn't. Uh, the uh, so uh, so in any event, uh, yeah. So that's where I go. Okay. And a final question is a post Thanksgiving question. Right. Pumpkin, apple, or pecan pie? <laughs> Chocolate. <laughs> 
And that will be the final question. <laughs> So thank you, President Schill, for joining us this afternoon and taking the time. We know you're incredibly busy. I hope that we had a chance to get to know our new president a little bit better. I know I certainly did. Um, and I want to take a moment to give him another round of applause. Thank you, President Schill. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Thank you all. Mm -hmm.